Good morning and uh, welcome to today's webinar about IPR. My name is Kori Björkstrand and uh, I'm a senior advisor at VXPO. For those of you unfamiliar with VXPO, VXPO is an organization with the main focus to help small and medium sized companies in Finland in their export issues. But now to today's agenda, IPR. Uh, we have really interesting guests here today to talk about this and um, today's webinar is also recorded and will be found on our YouTube channel afterwards. Now I give the first uh, presentation to Peter. Peter, you're welcome. Thank you very much, Kore, and, uh, and good morning to everybody. Let me try to quickly share my slides. I think you should be able to see them now. So my name is Peter Siegel. I'm working for the China IPS SME Help Desk. We are a, a project of the European Commission, and our goal is to help uh, European small and medium-sized enterprises aiming to export into China to access the Chinese market. And we provide uh, free and confidential intellectual property related advice. <clears throat> our, our free services include our inquiry helpline, which is the, the most prominent service that we provide. It is uh, essentially really what its name suggests, a help desk. So European companies can directly get in touch with us either via email, uh, by phone or, or through the form on our website. And we provide free confidential IP related advice in three working days. Um, we can provide really any kind of information as long as it's uh, IP and China related. Uh, we cover mainland China, Hong Kong, Macau and also Taiwan. So if you're, a, if you're an EU SME interested in expanding into the Chinese market, or if you already have a business plan that involves an IP risk, then please feel free to get in touch with us anytime and, uh, and we're very happy to help. We have a number of complementary activities as well. Uh, we frequently organize workshops, webinars. Uh, we're very happy to co-organize this webinar with VXPO. Uh, Pre-COVID, we would also organize in-person events quite frequently, which uh, are of course, uh, are, a bit on hold now, but we hope that we will be able to go back to to real life events uh, maybe in the fall. We also maintain our own website or blog. Uh, we have a number of, uh, of written guides, business guides, fact sheets. Here in this slide, you can see a couple of examples, um, quite, uh, I would say, visually pleasing and, and easy to understand uh, materials. So we're very happy to support your enterprise also by providing any kind of any kind of information material that uh, that you might be interested in, whether it is a more detailed IP guide on a specific sector, whether it is a, a quick fact sheet on, on the IP situation or the Chinese market. Um, so if you are interested in, in intellectual property in China, and I hope that uh, all of you joining this webinar are, then please feel free to get in touch with us at the China IP SME Help Desk. Our contacts will be circulated after the event. Here on this slide, you can also see my email, peter.siegel at china-iprhelpdesk.eu. Uh, please feel free to, to write us anytime. And uh, then without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Valentin de la Cour, who is our IP expert who will present today uh, about intellectual property in China. So thank you very much. And uh, Valentin, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Peter. I will share my slides. Yuri, can you see them? Can you see my slides? Yes. Yes, perfect. Yeah. Okay, perfect. It's not full screen though, but you can see. Here it yep. is. Yes, right. thank you. Well, hello everyone, and uh, many thanks for the to the organizers for the kind invitation to be here today. My name is Valentin Delecourt. I'm a Belgian lawyer. I used to live and work in China for a Chinese IP firm. So I've been active in the in the IP field for, for the last 15 years, including four years of uh, underground experience uh, in China. So we have about half an hour today about to talk about IP in China. It's of, it's of course a very uh, complex and, uh, and, 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 and important topic. We won't have the time to really uh, get into uh, the, de the details of IP protection in China. So my aim here today is really to give you 
more of a feel of what is going on in terms of IP when it comes to China today in 2021. And of course, I will give you a few practical advice, a few practical steps that you should undertake when uh, you, you, you decide to, 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 well, to enter the Chinese market or to deal with Chinese companies. To begin with, as an introduction, maybe one slide to remind you how important intangible assets have become today in, uh, in today's, well, knowledge-based, innovation-based economy. 1975, you can see that intangible constituted 17% of the corporate value of the best performing companies in the world, S&P 500 companies. Today, 2020, the, 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 the intangible assets constitute 90% of the corporate value of the same best performing companies. So it's just a reminder of how important intangibles have become today and intangibles, well, how do you protect them? Through IP rights and through trade secrets. And based on my experience, very often, well, SMEs and startups, they obviously know IP exists, they know it's important, but they perceive IP as a nice to have. They very often perceive IP as a cost and it's normal. I mean, as a young company, you focus on getting the right people in your organization, increasing your sales, get to your perfect clients. And IP is, is very often not at the top of your priorities. But really, and this is especially true when it comes to China, you should IP approach IP as an invention, not as a cost. You should treat IP as a profit center, uh, not as a cost. And, and I think it's really, really critical to keep that in mind when you approach China. Now, let's start with the first part of my presentation. I would like to give you uh, a, a, an overview of the context of IP in China and to, to make you understand how much IP has changed over the last decades. First thing that you should keep in mind is how much the IP landscape has evolved over the last decades. In 1978, when the country decided to open up to the outside world under the impulse of Deng Xiaoping, well, Basically, you had no IP law. China was a no man's land in terms of IP. You had no trademarks, no patents, no copyrights, nothing. Today, 2020, as we will see, IP has become a top national priority. Why? Well, simply because the Chinese economy has been shifting from a manufacturing export based economy towards an innovation based economy. Two, you may know that China is a member of the WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization. It's basically part to all the main international IP agreements and treaties. So basically China is part of the world IP order. And as a result of this, well, you have a complete set of Chinese IP laws in place today. And we're facing in China a very high legislative dynamism. All the laws are being constantly adapted to a very rapidly evolving uh, economy and landscape. And if you take, for example, the two last years, well, all the main Chinese IP laws have been amended. Second, important to note that China is the number one country in the world when it comes to the number of patent, trademark, and also design applications. 2015, China made the headlines because, well, more than a million invention patents had been filed with the Chinese Patent Office. It's a huge number. First time in history that such a high amount of patent applications had been filed with a single patent office. And this is a trend that is just going upwards. If you take 2018, well, more than a million and a half invention patent applications had been filed. Now, not only are Chinese companies massively using the domestic, the Chinese um, IP system, more and more Chinese companies are internationalizing, and that means that more and more they file um, they file um, applications abroad. So you more and more have Chinese companies nowadays that are developing valuable IP portfolios abroad. 
And if you take 2019, well, China became the number one country in terms of PCT applications. What's the PCT? To put it simply, it's basically an international agreement that enables companies to file patent applications at a, a, an international level. Okay. And Huawei, the Chinese telecom giant, was the top PCT applicant for that same year. If you take Europe, and trademarks, well, in 2020, China was the top trademark applicant at the European IP office. Okay, above Germany, above US, above Italy, above Britain. So again, this is an evidence that Chinese companies massively use the IP system, not only at home, but also at uh, internationally. Four, Important to know that China has become the most IP litigious country in the world. This is true since 2005, so many years already. If you take, for example, the number of patent litigations that were introduced in first instance in 2017, well, you're at more than 16,000 patent litigation cases, huge number. If you compare to my country, Belgium, I don't have the exact numbers, but we're probably at maximum 50 cases a year. So this has it's not just an, an, an impressive number. This has very practical consequences. If you have a lot of patent litigation going on in China, it means that the patent litigation system is massively used. It means that you have judges that have been involved in a 100, 200, 300, 400 patent litigation cases. So you do have in China very, very experienced IP judges I uh, won't have the time to explain you that, but you should know that you have specialized IP courts that have been set up in China since 2014, with, as a result, well, again, the fact that you have very knowledgeable and experienced IP judges that understand the value of a patent, that understand how important patents can be, and that basically render excellent judgments when it comes to patent litigation. Important to know is that most of these IP litigations are involve Chinese domestic companies. Only a fraction of the cases involve foreign companies. So this means that, well, again, you have Chinese companies that massively use the IP system. They build interesting IP portfolios and they don't hesitate to use their IP against their domestic competitors. Now, you do have a trend of more and more cases involving foreign businesses, but mainly as defendants, not as plaintiffs. So you have more cases where defendants, uh, where foreign businesses are attacked by Chinese IP owners for IP infringements. That's one thing you should know and you, you should be ready to face that. Second, you have more and more cases where basically the two parties are foreign businesses. What does that mean? Well, it means basically that more and more foreign businesses will use the Chinese jurisdiction against their competitors because the, China, because the Chinese system can be trusted. So if you take massive global uh, patent litigation cases, you very often have a case pending in the US, very often have a case pending in Europe, very often Germany, and then more and more you have a case pending in China. And that means that, well, basically the, 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 the system can be trusted. Foreign businesses wouldn't take the risk to involve their valuable patents in China if they could not trust the system. And Chinese is, uh, China is obviously a very strategic place where to litigate your patents because, well, through a single patent litigation case, you can either block the competitor from commercializing its products uh, or its technology in China, but you can also disrupt its supply chain because China remains a very important place when it comes to, to sourcing products, manufacturing products. And so if you can obtain from a Chinese judge an order forbidding your competitor to have some products or high tech components manufactured in China, it can have an impact on its global supply chain. So China is a very strategic place where to litigate IP. And it's more and more used by foreign businesses between themselves, not again Chinese competitors. I think it, it tells a lot about the evolution of IP in China. The state of innovation, uh, you may know that R&D spending in China have uh, grown massively 
tenfold between 2000 and 2016. So basically, China today is an important innovation center. The copycat era is way behind us, um, at, quoting uh, the, the, the VC, VC Kai Fu Li. We are way beyond that. So it's important to know that uh, while China is, is not anymore a complicated place, uh, massive amounts of money are invested in R&D centers. R&D centers are proliferating uh, around the country. And as a result, well, basically, uh, a lot of innovation is going on. And again, this translates in a lot of patent applications and the use of the IP system, because, well, basically, IP is there to enable companies to protect, appropriate, monetize on the result of their innovation. And if you look at the Global Innovation Index, well, China ranks 14. They don't look Finland, but for my country, Belgium, we, we, we were ranked last year 22nd. So China is uh, ranked higher in terms of innovation capabilities than Belgium. The state of entrepreneurship, I think it's also interesting to understand that you're probably all entrepreneurs in China. Well, you have a new generation of homegrown entrepreneurs that are evolving within a very unique ecosystem. 10, 15 years ago, what was the, 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 the key job to have and, and parents would be very proud of their children if they would join a state owned enterprise. Today, this has radically changed. Government authorities have massively promoted entrepreneurship. They have promoted mass entrepreneurship, uh, which means that, well, nowadays, uh, entrepreneurship is valorized in China. And you have uh, a, a lot of innovation and of entrepreneurship going on there. Now, entrepreneurs, Chinese entrepreneurs, they evolve in a very different ecosystem than ours. First thing uh, that, that is obvious, but that has an impact, is the scale of China's markets. When it comes to Finland or to my country, Belgium, very small markets. From the start, you need to think international. In China, it's very different. They can focus on their home markets, 1.4 billion people. If they make it big on their home markets, it means that they've become huge. Okay, And that, that gives them clearly an advantage. Chinese consumers are enthusiastic adopters of new technologies. They like to try new things. So they're very open to very open to new technologies, products uh, and, and, and ways of doing things. It's also a more developing market where you have less legacy of infrastructure. And so it means that it's, it's easier to break through with new technologies. For example, mobile payments have very rapidly becoming the, the, the main way of paying, paying. And then you also have less stringent privacy rules, easier to collect, process, monetize on the data that you collect. <clears throat> and so, well, in now in today's economy, where big data is so, uh, so valuable, again, this gives a very big advantage to uh, Chinese companies. Most important uh, to know is that IP has become a political imperative. Um, innovation and IP are promoted at the highest level of the Chinese authorities. This is very evident in the latest four, five year plan. You may know that every five year Chinese authorities publish a, a plan. Uh, they set goals for the evolution of the economy and, and, and they basically define the ways to achieve these development goals. And in the latest five year plan, well, very clear innovation is at the core. China wants to become technology independent. They want to, to, to rely less on foreign technology and so, well, massive investment in innovation. And as a result, well, massive investment in improving the IP system. This, of course, opens opportunities. Uh, they still need advanced technologies. And so, well, if you fit within the government plans, <coughs> if you have technologies that fit within the government's, uh, the government's priorities, well, you definitely have your place in China and plenty of opportunities, provided, of course, that you have a tailor-made and well-adapted uh, IP strategy to protect your competitive advantage. So what can we learn from these uh, these few facts and figures? Well, 
First of all, you will have understood that the Chinese IP landscape has changed. China now massively uses IP and they're uh, in a certain way at the front, forefront of the evolution of IP at a, a, a global level. Second, while it's possible to protect your IP rights in China, there is a complete and advanced legal system in place. It's widely used by Chinese companies. It's accessible to foreign companies. And so, of course, as a foreign company wanting to access the Chinese market, wanting to deal with China, you should use the IP system and you should, well, basically understand and def define your, your, your IP strategy. Three, it's possible to enforce your IP rights in China. Chinese companies uh, extensively use the IP litigation and, and IP enforcement system. It's the most IP litigation country in the world. Again, the enforcement mechanisms are available to foreign businesses, so you should understand them and you should be ready to use them either as a, uh, a plaintiff or as a defendant. Four, Maybe more important than, than, than everything, IP has become essential for Chinese businesses. They're more IP aware, they are more IP rich, they develop valuable IP portfolios at home and more and more abroad as well. And so basically China's stake in the IP system has grown. The whole economy is relying more and more on a reliable IP system. And so while well, no other, uh, I mean, they, 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 they have to have a working an efficient IP system in place. Strategic imperative to close the, technolo the technological gap. This definitely creates opportunities. Right? It's the transition from made in China to invented in China. They want to end their reliance on foreign technology. And so if you're a tech company, if you have industries, if you're active in industries and technologies that are deemed strategic by the Chinese authorities, plenty of opportunities, technology transfer, contract manufacturing, R&D uh, agreements can be concluded with uh, Chinese uh, businesses. Um, that's for sure. But so understand that your future in China will depend on your competitive advantage, innovative technologies, foreign, valuable, attractive brands that need to be protected through a good IP strategy by using the patent system, the trade secret protection system, the trademark system, the design system. So let's now focus on a few steps that you should take um, and that you that you should focus on to protect your intangibles, to protect your competitive advantage when you enter the Chinese market. First step. And this is uh, may sound obvious, but actually it's it's more complex that we that that one may imagine is that you you need to know what you have to to protect. What's your IP? What are your intangible assets? This is the first question that you need to ask yourself. Intangible assets, well, obviously they're non-physical, and so they may sometimes be difficult to identify. And so the first thing to do is to perform an IP audit, because very often uh, SMEs, scale-ups, startups, they don't have a good overview of their IP assets. They don't know what their IP assets are. They don't understand the value of their IP assets. Uh, they, they don't have a clear strategy on how to protect their competitive advantage. OK, and, and, and this is really the first step. It's you need to know what you have to protect. And so conduct an IP audit, audit, ask yourself this question, are my products, are my technologies protected? How are they protected? Through IP rights, trademarks, patents, copyrights, designs, or through trade secrets, confidential information? Is the protection relevant to, to, to you business-wise? Um, so, so make this audit a certain legal status, understand the territorial coverage of your protection, understand the value of your intangibles, understand the risks, and based on that audit, well, you should take a certain number of actions. So once you've understood what you have to protect and how, well, you will have to, to, to take the relevant uh, actions and to define a strategy. Of course, budgets are limited, especially for, for smaller companies. So you really have to prioritize your protection needs. 
Um, and, and when it comes to territoriality, because an IP right, it's territorial. I will come back on this, but it's not because you're protected in Finland that you are protected in China. Uh, well, you have to ask yourself, where should I invest in IP protection? What are my markets of today, of tomorrow? What are my competitors' markets? Where are potential investors located? Very important in China, plenty of companies have money to invest, but if you don't have a relevant China IP strategy, they won't be interested by your file. They won't invest a cent in your company. Uh, and then last question, very important, again, especially when it comes to China, where will you manufacture or outsource the development of your products? Typically, you want to have your products manufactured in China. You need to find a reliable manufacturing partner. And then you will uh, have to communicate information, sensitive information, enable a Chinese company to manufacture your products or high tech components of your products. Well, you better have an IP strategy in place and an IP portfolio covering China to control the exploitation and, 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 and to control the manufacturing of your products. So important to have an IP strategy. Very important step three to create a bundle of rights. All too often, um, companies really focus <clears throat> on one type of right. You're a cosmetic company. What is important to you? Your trademark. And you just focus on your trademark. You forget about designs, how to protect the external aspects of your product. Uh, even patents can be very relevant in that sector. And, and that's a mistake. On the other hand, uh, manuf manufacturing industrial companies, they will focus on their technologies, on their patents, their trade secrets. They won't pay attention to trademarks. That's a mistake. So you really should understand that each IP right uh, is there to, to protect something different. And you should create a bundle of rights. The more rights you have, the better equipped you will be to face sometimes very challenging situations on the Chinese market. So understand that trademarks are, are there, well, basically to protect the indication of origin of goods and services. Patents protect technical features of your products and processes. Designs protect the external aspects of your products. Copyright protect creative work. It's a very broad notion, it goes from, uh, from, from technical drawings to computer programs and databases. And trade secrets protect confidential information really important nowadays it, it, it's used to predict algorithms source codes data sets etc now important to understand that one single object technology product can be protected by different types of ip rights to illustrate this a very simple thing packaging of biscuits well look these are all the the possible ip rights that could be used to protect that packaging so it's, of course, an illustration to make a point. I would never advise a client to invest in all that, but you get it. Don't focus on one type of IP right. And remember that one single object uh, can be protected by different types of IP rights. Step four, uh, this is maybe the most important slide of my presentation, have enforceable IP rights. First thing to, 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 to remember, I mentioned it already, but IP rights are territorial rights. So you need to really assess what countries you need to be uh, to be protected in. Again, it's not because, because you have a trademark covering Finland that you are protected in China. OK, so you need to do a strategic analysis of where should I file? And definitely China should be on your radar. Second, registration is needed. Understand that, <coughs> sorry, with the exception of copyrights, IP protection is not automatic. You need to ask to be protected. And you need to ask that sometimes at, at a specific point in time. For example, in order to obtain a patent, uh, a patent covers an invention, that invention must be new, which means that if you made it public or if you protected it elsewhere, uh, the chance is high that you won't be able to protect it anymore in China, for example. So you need to anticipate, you need to plan ahead, you need to plan early. And keep in mind that if you don't apply for protection in China, well, it's like giving a free license to use your IP, use your patent, use your design, use your trademark on the Chinese market. It's like giving a free license to your Chinese competitors, 
to your foreign competitors active on the Chinese market. This is very often something you don't want to. So again, keep China on the radar. And when you prioritize your, your, your protection, your protection needs and actions, well, take China into account. And very often, very important, sorry, adapt to the local specificities. The way IP works in China is not necessarily the, the same as it works in the US, in Europe, in Finland. So understand how it works and adapt. Step five, don't forget your trade secrets. Um, trade secrets are more and more important for different types of, of, of technologies and sectors. Um, won't enter into the deta into details, but keep in mind that to protect your confidential information and benefit from the trade secret protection regime, you need to proactively adopt secrecy protection measures. If you don't have them, information won't qualify as a trade secret and you won't be protected. So typically sign NDAs, confidentiality agreements, that is the first step, but it's not enough. Um, select the information you share with Chinese partners, control the access to the information, label information as being confidential, have a good IT system in place with cyber security measures that are that are relevant and up to date, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You have a whole set of uh, reasonable steps that you should take to protect the confidentiality of your information, and it's very important to to adopt them. So, trade secret protection is not automatic; it is conditioned to the adoption of protection measures. Step six, and this is the last one: pay attention to IP in your contracts. Contracts are absolutely key to protect your IP, so pay attention to your IP provisions and confidentiality provisions in your agreements with your Chinese partners. And keep in mind that IP is relevant to numerous contracts, not only technology contracts, uh, co-development, tech transfer, technology consultancy agreement. Obviously, their IP will be key because it, it's, it's, it's really the object of the agreements. Um, but for example, manufacturing agreements will have an important IP and, and confidentiality component. Same for sales agreement, distribution agreements. If, you, if the value of your product is a trademark, while well, in your distribution agreement with Chinese distributors, IP will be extremely important. Confidentiality agreements, employment agreements, very important to make sure that your employees transfer their IP to your company, same with consultants, et cetera, et cetera. So keep in mind how important IP is in contracts. Contracts should be negotiated in great detail when it comes to China and pay attention to IP and confidentiality provisions. So this leads me to my last slide to conclude this very short and brief presentation on IP in China. Um, well, basically important to align your IP strategy with your Chinese ambitions and Chinese projects. Reminds, uh, keep in mind that IP is there to make your comp company more competitive, more valuable, and to create and generate opportunities for you. This is critical when it comes to China. Uh, I don't know of any company that succeeds in China without a competitive advantage that is protected by a good and relevant IP strategy. And second, well, this requires to be proactive. This requires to have a tailor-made IP strategy adapted to your company, to your business model, and to the Chinese specificities. So start early, plan ahead and anticipate, define your strategy, perform an audit to understand really what you have to protect, register, Remember, protection is not automatic. You need to ask to be protected and go through a registration procedure. Layer your IP, create a bundle of rights. Don't limit yourself to one single, one type of IP rights. Adapt to the local uh, specificity. It's really important to understand how it works in China. Pay attention to your trade secrets and the top reasonable steps protection is not automatic. And last but not least, negotiate your contracts in great details. Thank you very much. That's it uh, for my part. And I will um, 
stop sharing my slides and give the floor to the next speaker. Yes, thank you of very much, Valentine. Of course, available to, uh, to answer questions at the yes, end. Yes, there yeah. was at least one question. Can we share this uh, PowerPoint to the guests of this webinar? Yeah, sure. Sure, yes, sure. so we will we will uh, share it later, and of course the whole webinar is on our YouTube channel afterwards. So, but is there any questions to to Valentine in this stage? I can ask one question. Uh, it's either to you or Peter. Um, if a SME from Finland wants to uh, needs help, how does the process look like? Uh, in in short, like uh, they first contact you, and what happens after that? Okay, uh, well, two things: either you go with the help desk, and and they have a first line um, first line of advice, uh, and then very often they will refer you to lawyers. I'm a lawyer, so uh, I, I, I I on a daily basis basically support companies with their IP issues when it comes to China. And then, well, uh, I'm very happy to set up a call. Uh, we have a discussion. I uh, have to understand the needs of the companies, and then uh, we can start a collaboration, uh, work on the on the IP portfolio, on the agreements, on uh, how to structure your IP transfer, uh, whatever. Um, but so, yeah, either either way. Okay. Thank, <laughs> thanks for that. Answer. And I, I I do have a European client base, so I'm very happy to to help a Finnish company if I can. Okay. Thank you very much. What can I ask shortly yes. from Valentine? Uh, Valentine, do you have any idea about the cost? Of course, it depends a lot on the company and the products and all that. Yeah. But can you give some estimation of the cost? It's, it's, it, it's, it's I mean, it's so different. The investment. It, it, it depends on the, it depends on the IP rights also. You know, protecting a trademark is, is fairly cheap. Uh, the official taxes are a couple of hundred euros, then you have to pay okay, a service provider, but it won't be very expensive for one trademark in one class. A patent is much more complex. Uh, you need to understand the technology, draft your patent applications, go through the whole uh, protection procedure. But very often this will be managed from the country of origin of, of, of the, the, the company because they will use the PCT agreement. Huh? So this is this international agreement that enables you to file patent applications abroad. And so the costs will be included in a much more global um global offer from 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 local uh, service providers um designs are not very expensive trademarks are not very expensive keep in mind really that the the it's a good time today to invest in ip in china because the system is good and you cover a huge territory you cover a huge population uh doesn't mean that china is relevant for any kind of business huh? don't, 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 it's not what i'm saying but if your, your, if China is on your radar, um, go for it. But the costs, I mean, so in the abstract, uh, it, it, it can go from a couple of, of euros to, to tens of thousands of euros. It really depends on, on the complexity and what types of IP rights. As a general rule, uh, patents are more expensive, but you do have in China some fairly cheap uh, alternatives. You have, I didn't have to talk about it, but utility models. It's a kind of small patent that doesn't cost a lot of money, uh, that is easy to get, that provides you very good protection. Uh, same thing for designs. Uh, it's a bit the same. And, and designs and utility models are massively used by Chinese companies and are underused by uh, foreign businesses. So you do have alternatives and you can find ways uh, to 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 limit the costs, uh, but giving you an estimate is really uh, really not something possible. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Um, in this stage, I think we say thank you to you, Valentine, for a really interesting presentation, and um, then we give the word to Tobias Bachmann, our case company sector design. Thank you. Thank you, Cora, and thank you, Valentin. It was a very good presentation, and I believe it included very much sound advice on how to enter China and IPR in general. But my name is Tobias Bakhan, and I work for Sector Design, a uh, Finnish, I would say, medium company at this point. Uh, we produce wooden lights, wooden design lights, 
in Finland of Finnish materials, which are very, with a very export heavy sort of market. But I thought I have roughly 15 minutes to speak, so I thought I'd shortly tell you about our company in general, a little bit about our global uh, market, our IPR in general, and then some sort of case examples, uh, case examples from China, which much relates to, to what Karita just asked regarding to costs and what not with a couple of, of successful examples and a couple of more difficult examples, just to, just to showcase some of the challenges that you might encounter with IPR in China. Uh, so the company Sector Design was founded in 1995, originally manufactured furniture, tables and chairs, which still can be found in some embassies uh, and similar museums and whatnot around the world. In 1999, the company started producing lights to complement the furniture, and the furniture was quite quickly sold. The furniture part sold away and then just continued with the focus on producing lights. We currently have, depending on how you count it, but around 10 office employees and then 30 to 40 employees manufacturing with an office in Kauniainen near Helsinki, and our factory is in Heinola, just above Lahti, so about an hour and a half from Helsinki, northbound. Uh, we currently have about 25 models, which we sell worldwide, and they are all designed by architect Seppo Koho. And we are among the largest design furniture manufacturers in Finland. Then it's sort of a question of how you would uh, class a design company or whatnot, but we still are up there. Uh, we currently export to over 70 countries, of course, to some countries more and others less. Uh, we mainly export, or our main market is Europe, with USA as a growing market, which we sort of have as, uh, what should I say, a, a, a goal to sort of get a better foothold in the market there, but it takes time and, and it's a lot of work. Uh, we work through a network of representatives, meaning that in most markets where we sort of have a steady market, we have a representative who is able to, to give, give our customers local, local service. We only sell a B2B, so we work through retailers, so the local representatives is sort of in charge of, of handling the retailer network in, in any certain countries. Uh, yeah, as mentioned, Europe is our largest market. South America is an interesting sort of market for us because we haven't done any marketing there, but, but in, in relation to that, we export a surprising amount of lamps to, to Brazil and other countries who sort of then distribute them around in South America. Uh, enough about export. I'll jump over to IPR. So the background here shown is sort of our to-do list regarding to IPR cases and infringement cases, only infringement cases uh, that we encounter. So we can sort of keep track of what's happening and what not. We have an annual turnover of about 10 million. So the amount of cases that we handle is fairly large for our sort of company size. So about 100 infringement cases per year, and these infringement cases are sort of the most extreme uh, cases we encounter in, in China. Not all cases we encounter in China, China, but the extreme ones that sort of require extra attention, and then the rest are mainly in our key markets, so Europe and, and USA, which we also sort of handle 
with a special care because that's sort of the interesting part of us for us. And this is sort of interesting because I mean China is a huge part of our IPR strategy, even if we don't really export anything into China. And Asia overall is sort of not really that large of a market for us. So there to sort of connect back to what Valentin said about disrupting supply chains and whatnot, it's very important to be aware of the the sort of, I would say, risk that China imposes in certain categories. Uh, we register designs, trademarks and copyrights where possible. We don't work with patents because we don't have anything that could be considered patents and trade secrets. Uh, we are not, I mean, our supply chain is sort of under our own control, so so we are aware of trade secrets, but but it's not really an integral part of our IPR strategy. But as you can see, 45 design registrations, 90 trademarks and 25 copyright registrations. So we very much utilize this sort of bundle thinking where we uh, protect our products using all three of these, even if the infringements, not always, is a bundle. I mean, sometimes companies use our trademarks, sometimes they use our designs, and uh, sometimes they use our pictures and whatnot, to which we enforce with copyright registrations. We rarely have to sue companies or litigate, but we do have a handful of litigations per year, of which sort of maybe half uh, get to the point where, where the court has to give a judgment on the matter. Most cases, or not most, but many cases are settled before the court when, when sort of the counterparty realizes what they're, what they're up against. Uh, in China, I, we don't have any ongoing litigations in China right now, but we have had four to five uh, litigations, of which uh, two or three have been, have had a, a court decision issued. Uh, here are some examples of, of product copies we have encountered. On the far left, you can see our original products and then the rest of them are what we consider infringing products. All of these infringing products uh, are manufactured and originate from China, even if most of them we have encountered in uh, retailers and other sources in Europe. So China is sort of an integral part of the infringement supply chain. Uh, copies are manufactured elsewhere as well, but, but I'm fairly confident to say to at least 90% in one way or another originate from, from China. Uh, our IPR strategy in general sort of works. Our company has a core value of, of in Finnish, there's a very good word, Laws, which would sort of translate to fairness in English, where we sort of want to treat everyone as fairly as possible. So many cases of infringing products are sort of just oversight from someone, not someone not really aware that this product is protected or, or that there is sort of an original author to the products and whatnot. So our strategy much originates from informing infringing uh, infringing cases of, of them infringing our rights and sort of if the case then can be agreed on those grounds so the infringement stops then we really don't see any point in in proceeding further with anything but mostly that is not the case which is also understandable because companies sort of buy large stocks of lamps or or invest large amounts into manufacturing so they sort of not really that easily want to let that investment go to waste so so often there is some sort of dispute regarding these things uh, 
most of our cases we encounter in Europe, we demand to know the source of the infringement and most often the source traces back to China. And if a Chinese sort of manufacturer starts showing up enough times or, or if the copies are such quality that we feel that we need to, to stop. For example, in the, in the lower row, the second from the left is an example of an infringing product that we feel we need to sort of investigate because it's the quality is it's sort of paradoxical but it's fairly good and we sort of don't want to see those kind of copies on the market where where the customer has a real difficult time to see the difference between the original product and the counterfeit product uh, case examples one of these companies that we had three or four companies reveal as their source was in China, uh, then the process in China for enforcing rights, as Valentin said, registering the, the rights is not really that expensive or difficult. And we, I don't think we've ever had any difficulties on that part, but the part of enforcing rights is in China very formal when compared to many other parts of the world. Meaning that evidence needs to be notarized at the proper institutions, and this is something that is very costly. Just to give an example, the easiest cases handled in Europe would cost, the enforcement costs only would cost something between 500 and 2,000 euros, depending on, on the country and whatnot, but in China, it's almost always a minimum of 5,000 euros. So the cost is fairly much higher in China than in other places. Uh, however, in this case, we, we found the manufacturer, we sent them, we did the notarized investigation and, and got a report, sent them a cease and desist letter, and they complied right away. They reimbursed all of our costs, if I remember correctly, 9,500 US dollars, and signed the undertaking not to, to sell or distribute these copies anymore. The picture is sort of kind of small in this context, but it's a picture of their warehouse full of copies of our products. So this is sort of a best case scenario, what can be achieved if, if you have the proper registrations and other things in place, so you are able to enforce. And then I have a couple of cases which are more difficult. Uh, similarly to the previous case, we found out the Chinese manufacturer, we sued them to court, we got a court decision that it was a copyright infringement. Uh, the problem there was that our sort of legal costs exceeded or was sort of exponential to what the counterparty's costs were. So it was in the counterparty's interest to sort of just pull out or stretch out the proceedings as far as possible. So the member, the only member of the board happily told us that he would appeal anything in all eternity as far as he could because it was fairly cheap for him and that way he could avoid paying any damages for all eternity. And this sort of connects back to what Valentin said as an investment. We saw this as an investment. For us it was more important to get the court judgment to which we can refer other cases to sort of streamline these uh, processes in the future. As you can see, it cost of us tens of thousands of euros and the damages were sort of ridiculous in, in contrast to that. But at least I and our board as well see that it was a, a reasonable investment for us to do. The other cases for us is we, an European importer, which we are still litigating. The process has taken us about six or seven years at this point with a Chinese manufacturer, which we found out through our own sort of investigations. We settled the matter with the manufacturer and got some damages. The cost far exceeded our damages, but again, it was a sound investment for us to sort of have these court decisions, making it easier for us to handle other things. But we are still litigating against the European importer. 
but sort of for me to summarize what I feel is important for IPR in China, much connects to what Valentin said. <clears throat> One of our main problems was when Tula founded the company, she sort of believed that the, the technique to manufacturing our products was so complicated that that itself would be a protection against, against counterfeits, which sort of that in itself reduced the interest in, in IPR protection at the time. And also there wasn't enough resources at the time for her to be fully aware of the risks involved in not protecting your product, uh, which are available now. So I think the IPR China Help, IPR China Help Desk is a great resource for companies today to sort of get the general information they need. So they're aware of what they need to do in an IPR landscape. Even if China is not an interesting market, it, I still think it's very important to consider China in the general IPR strategy. Also, as Valentine said, it's not very expensive to register the rights, but enforcing the rights, which you also need to consider because it's not always enough to just register them. Okay, thank so you. It's important as well. But that pretty much includes, concludes what I had to say. Okay, thank you very much, Tobias. And um, yeah, I think we have time for some question if there is still someone that wants to ask something from Tobias. Uh, let me just, yeah. At the moment, I don't see any any questions. But um, when did you start to co cooperate with uh, China Help Desk first time? Uh, we gathered China Help Desk a few years ago after a presentation. They approached us and sort of presented themselves. And and I mean, we sort of have much of the knowledge we need already, but I, I really think that China Help Desk is a, is a good resource for companies sort of starting at these times to sort of turn to and, and get information if they so need. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. And if, if there are some questions, you can of course send them afterwards to the presenters or to VXPO. And um, I thank in this stage all the presenters and all the guests for today's really interesting webinar on IPR issues. So thank you very much, Valentine, Peter, Tobias and all the guests. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks.